Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's LinkedIn Live. Well, something really special today. We have Vijay Balasubramaniam, and he is the co-founder and CEO of Pindrop Security, which I know many of you are aware of. They've just released a new report on voice intelligence and security that has a lot of really interesting findings in it. So we're going to dive into that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Vijay. Thanks so much for having me, Karen. Great. So just before we jump into the report, uh, maybe you could just give, for those who aren't familiar, an overview of Pindrop. Absolutely. So at Pindrop, uh, you know, we focus on a multi-factor authentication and deep fake detection uh, from a security standpoint. We've been doing this for, you know, over 12 years. Mm. Deep fake detection itself, we've been doing for the last, and we currently have eight of the top 10 banks, five of the top seven insurances, and some of the biggest retailers, healthcare providers as customers. And what this means is we get to analyze close to 5 billion voice interactions and there's, you know, close to 3 million fraud events that we've identified. And so a lot of what uh, we have put out in the voice intelligence report is the trends that we see over the last year and over time. Those are some, some big numbers and uh, congrats on all of your uh, success in this area. You know, it's, it's impossible to pick up a newspaper or a journal today and not read about them. Uh, uh, threats uh, from uh, voice intelligence. So let's let's dive into this report. Maybe what are the highlights or key findings of the report in your view? I think, you know, fundamentally there's several key findings. The first is that, you know, one contact center fraud is rising. So, you know, over the last two years, it's grown by 60% such that one in every 700 calls is actually fraudulent. And, you know, we've seen this trend uh, constantly increase largely because of several things. One, you know, two years back, there were a lot more ways in which fraudsters could make money. Uh, if you remember two years back, there used to be all of these unemployment benefits and these PPPs. Mm -hmm. And so there was an entire class of fraudsters that were created that went and found ways to make money out of those schemes. Uh, and once those got shut off, they were like, okay, how do we start uh, stealing more money? Uh, and they realized mm -hmm. uh, going to the contact center and social engineering call center agents is a very, very robust way of stealing money, largely because if you look at most organizations, they're extremely mature on their digital side of things. They've got their digital channel, super secure, super protected. They have a list of tools protecting you, but on the voice channel, they have very little and they are completely on the mercy of their call center agents trying to determine, are they speaking to a good person? Are they speaking to a bad person? And most importantly, these contact center agents are largely uh, rewarded based on customer satisfaction. So they're trying to give the fraudster the best experience they can have. And the best experience for a fraudster is when they can actually move money out or get access to healthcare records and, and so on. So everything is misaligned in this environment, which is why you're seeing this real increase. And you can see high profile incidents like the MGM hack that happened mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was largely because if, you know, social engineering on the phone, it was a 10 minute phone conversation that took down a $40 billion organization and had them spend $8 million a day to this attack. And so uh, I think uh, that's one big find, that it is programmatically increasing across all the organizations we serve. Let me pause. Does that make sense? It 100% makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as a consumer who needs to call from time to time yeah. uh, into a call center, you know, I... I I understand, you know, they, they are trying to give customer experience. And I think it's just so important for us to recognize the, the obstacles they're up against in trying to do that. Because, yeah. you know, the, with deep fakes today, which we'll talk more about, I don't know how they tell. Maybe the answer is pin drop. Yeah. Yeah. The answer, you know, one of the answers is pin drop, right? Like we are incredibly proud of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. But you're right. The second big finding is the massive explosion of deep fakes within as as a tool that these attackers are using in order to get past you know the controls that people have put in right and so one of the really interesting findings is 
overall, we've seen several customers where 0.1% of all of the calls coming into their call center have uh, some kind of synthetic uh, element to it. But to give you a more easier way to understand this, last year when we were monitoring uh, deep fakes, what we found is we'd see one deep fake attack a month. Mm -hmm. And then in the first four months of this year, across several customers, each of them is seeing one deep fake attack every single day. So for mm -hmm. these customers, what they've fundamentally gone from is one attack a month to one every single day. So close to a 450% increase in the amount of deep fake fraud just in the first four months compared to all of last year. So mm -hmm. that's a meteoric rise in the amount of deep fake attacks that we're seeing. And the year is just beginning. Yeah. And just to put some numbers, so it's roughly from 12 a year to 365 a year. Uh, exactly. Right? It is it's exponential. More, yeah, there are yeah. certain customers who are seeing one in every thousand calls. And, you know, these customers could get tens of thousands of calls every single day. One in every thousand calls, you know, turning out to be a deep fix. So what it means for some of these customers who are on the real extreme end of these attacks, and these are really large organizations that are suffering this kind of thing, mm -hmm. is they're getting a deep fake attack every single hour. So the average turns out to be one a day, but there are certain customers who are getting a deep fake attack every single hour. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so maybe it makes sense to maybe talk about this by industry segment or something. So if we think about like banking and finance, I know JP Morgan released some numbers a month or so ago that I found astounding. How can institutions prepare for, for these kinds of threats? Yeah. So, you know, first you need to understand what are these attackers actually doing here? And, you know, fundamentally what we found is these uh, deep fake attacks, there are three big categories of these deep fake attacks. One is they're trying to do essentially reconnaissance. So traditionally, uh, you know, uh, what we and this this reconnaissance is really important to understand in the context of the broader security landscape. So data breaches, you've heard of data breaches over and over again. Last year was a mammoth year for data breaches. There were about 3000 reported incidents of data breaches. And the previous year, it was 1800. So, you know, almost doubling of data breaches incidents. And what that means is a lot of these attackers have access to a lot of your information, right? Like mm -hmm. your social security number, your date of birth, your address. Uh, but what sense do they make of it, right? Like I have, Karen, for example, your social security number and your address. But I don't know, you know, who do you bank with? You know, how much money do you have in your account? So what we're finding is these attackers are actually taking these social security numbers and punching it against the self-service system of every single bank among the top 10 banks or the top 20 banks. Because when I punch in your social security number at bank number one and you don't have an account with them, they're like, we don't, we, we don't understand this social security number. Can you please punch it again? But when they punch it with, an, with a bank that you actually have an account, they're like, welcome back, Karen. Uh, do you want to know your account balance? And you're like, yes. And then they're like, okay, you have $300,000 in your bank account. And they're like, okay, we now have someone who has $100,000 or more. So that entire account mm -hmm. reconnaissance has now been completely automated with generative AI. What they're having is traditionally they had to punch your social security number with digits. Now they're mm -hmm. getting these systems that can actually speak your social security number because the system on the other end is actually saying, have a conversation, right? Like, just tell me what do you want? Tell me your address and things like that. So they are training these systems to have all of these snippets and they're doing reconnaissance. And in one example, we found they hit a 300, an account that had $300,000 and immediately that information got forked to another set of fraud gangs. And about five minutes after they found the account, we saw 75 accounts punching through, trying to get to a call center agent to try and steal money. We shut down all of it, but once the uh, bank figured out this account was under attack, they then checked other channels and found that the fraudsters had already managed to wire $15,000 through the online channels. Mm. And so the fact is that once these attackers find a risky account, 
through these uh, generative AI tools that they've created, mm -hmm. they're then going to work almost very quickly and trying to steal uh, money from it. Wow. Does that make sense? It does in a scary sort of way. <laughs> it, it does. So yeah, let's let's talk for a minute about media and political trust. So there was a significant part of the report that indicates, talked about the risk uh, to media and political trust. Uh, can you say more about that? Oh, yeah, it is. You know, like if you look, uh, you know, when we did the analysis, the number one place is obviously financial institutions, which I think scored about 60 percent of uh, people are concerned about risk to their bank accounts and sure. things like that. But immediately after that came media. Uh, and it is it is absolutely a concern. You know, we started this year and in January of this year, you had the first case of election interference with the with President Biden's robocall. And we are the folks mm. who discovered the AI application used to create that robocall, which turned out to be 11 labs. But, you know, you're already seeing a lot of instances where people are using this, like, for example, Tom Hanks, you know, never sold dental plan ads. You know, he's now selling dental plan ads, right? And so there are a lot of these examples. There are a lot of great examples as well. When you look at the report, uh, there's a lot of positive sentiment. About 37% of people uh, looked at deep fakes and voice cloning positively because they'd either seen the Andy Warhol diaries or they had right. seen for example, AGT, Elvis Presley coming back to life and singing. So there's a lot of positive examples and Val Kilmer found his voice, Randy Travis, a country singer. So there are a lot of great mm -hmm. positive examples. But the, but the fact is that you, if you don't know what is human and what is machine anymore, you are in a world of incredible disinformation right now where you don't know whether it is the celebrity saying something the politician saying something and you also have the reverse problem which is i could have said something bad and then i come and say no that was a deep fake of me that wasn't mm. me saying that and so there's both of these issues and we're starting to see not just the attacks become more sophisticated the tools increasing in sophistication. Mm. And what I mean by that, and I can jump into that if you'd like, but just the sophistication of tools available for these attackers has grown exponentially. I, I would like to talk about that because I think that brings us to investments in Gen AI and, and maybe some other tools as well. But I think that's an important area for, for us to touch on for sure. Yeah. So, you know, there's two incredible things, stats around this explosion one is, I, you know, because we've been doing deep fake detection for a really long time, we've seen the original deep fake tools like Liarbird and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember right two years back when uh, Google wanted to use John Legend's voice on the Google Home, they got John Legend. He spent hours on, you know, recording his voice so that he could, you know, when you asked for the weather from Google Home, you could hear John Legend say the weather in San Francisco is, you know, a balmy 80 degrees or whatever, right? Like in his now you're gonna have to you're gonna have to work on your impression, DJ. <laughs> You know, for, for an Indian trying to sound like John Legend, I think those, those are, you know, two. John Legend is way too much swagger to pull it off. Uh, but I understand the point. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it, you know, and, and at, at that point in time, the st state of the art used to be 20 hours of someone until you mm. got a faithful reproduction of their voice. Yeah. Now you need five seconds. And that's the crazy ex speed at which these systems, there are a lot of people, including my team, who's created a voice of mine. We require just 10 seconds of a YouTube video. We did this with Attorney General Formella, you know, who was the New Hampshire mm -hmm. Attorney General who did this incredible thing. We, using his permission, we actually replicated his voice, you know, as we were speaking at the Attorney General Symposium. And the rest of the Attorney Generals 40% thought the deep fake voice was his real voice. And so the fact is that, you know, it's the situation where it's become so easy to replicate someone's voice. And the other part of this is the number of sheer number of tools available to do this. We track all of these tools. At the end of the end of last year, uh, two years back, there was just a single tool to do this. At the end of last year, there were 120 tools that were available that could clone your voice. 
by March of this year, there were 358 tools or AI applications that mm. can clone your voice and can clone it with five seconds of audio. Yeah. So the these tools are, as you point out, both useful in sort of positive ways and also can be destructive, like I think everything with, with AI or actually any technical tool that we have, right? You can use them for, for good or for evil. And yeah. so how do we... I know there's a lot of money pouring into this space on the, uh, what should we call it, the defensive side, but yeah. maybe the offensive, anyway, the, the side of good, there's yeah. a lot of money pouring in the space and also a lot pouring in on the, on the hacker side. How, how are, are you, or how do you foresee these technologies? You know, what, what can we do about it? You know, we're just not as humans wired to yeah. be able to tell the difference, yeah. uh, but hopefully uh, there are tools or tools coming that will help with that. Yeah. And so you're absolutely right. As humans, you know, just in the audio domain, humans have a 38% accuracy in determining mm -hmm. whether something is deep fake or real. So, you know, you're really, really poor, right? Like you're going to get it wrong two out of three times. You're going to get, you're going to uh, mislabel something. So your years are not good at detecting this. Right. However, right, like, you know, with good AI, you can actually detect a lot of these things. There is this class of technologies called liveness, which is essentially determining, is this a live human on the other end of an interaction or not? And so that liveness set of technologies uh, are, you know, really good at being able to determine this. Uh, you know, there are certain characteristics that we we tend to say there are certain tenets that live systems should have, which we think are important for them to, to actually determine deep fakes versus real. But like, for example, Pindrop's liveness detection system has an accuracy of 99% in detecting mm -hmm. deep fakes. And we've had, you know, we're the winners of the FTC voice cloning challenge. We had mm -hmm. uh, the NPR reporters test a whole bunch of deep fake tools that said they're 90% or higher in accuracy. We're the only ones who who in their blind test showed a 96.4% accuracy mm -hmm. on clips five to eight seconds long, right? And so we can do this at accuracy. And the reason you're able to do this is when you look at something like a human voice, there are 8,000 samples of your voice every single second when you're capturing it on mediums like this. So there are 8,000 points every single second where a machine can get it wrong because it's trying to replicate your voice. It's trying to replicate something that's God-given. And there are a lot of spatial and temporal artifacts that we look at to determine something is machine-generated as opposed to human. And those artifacts not just tell you that it's a deep fake, you can actually use those artifacts to say which machine was used to create the deep fake. Mm -hmm. Each of these machines is inhuman in very, very specific ways. Okay. So like typewriters used to be, right? Back in the day, there's a, there's a signature associated with the machine. Yes, there's a fake print. We call it a fake print. But that is how we discovered that the Biden robocall was created by Eleven Labs. The yeah. imprint on that uh, piece of audio was so remarkably that of a particular AI app that we were like, okay, it is this particular AI app. Oh. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your team that's doing all of this, this work. Do I remember correctly that you were sort of born out of Georgia Tech? Yes. So I did my PhD from Georgia Tech. Uh, mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, Pindrop was actually my PhD research. And so, you mm -hmm. know, uh, we started there and we've continued that tradition one in every five employees at Pindrop actually has a PhD in machine learning or signal processing. So it's a very high concentration of research. And that's because a lot of what we have to do is, you know, very, very cutting edge. Like a lot of these technologies don't exist. How do you determine something is machine or human generated mm -hmm. by artifacts and sound? That's required us to create a brand new technology. And it's one of the reasons we right now, even though we, you know, we're a 250 person organization and our engineering team is about 110 of it, we have 137 patents to our name. So more than a patent per uh, person in engineering. So uh, it's a very high concentration of research and a very high concentration of innovation uh, at Pindrup. Yeah, terrific.
So I think sort of the sort of start to bring us to a close, considering the findings of this report, which which are available, it was released uh, earlier this week, and we can provide links to in the show notes and the, and the comments section. Considering the, fi- the findings, um, what do you believe are the most pressing priorities for organizations who are looking to enhance their voice security and, and fraud prevention strategies in the yeah. coming years? Yeah, so with the explosion of generative AI, I think the number one security question has become, are you interacting with a human or are you interacting with a machine? And it has fundamentally thrown everything out of the window, right? Like when someone's opening up a new account, is the account being opened up by a synthetic identity that doesn't exist? And you used to be able to detect synthetic identities, you no longer can detect them because of how sophisticated these generative AI tools have become in creating Uh, likenesses of humans in both voice, video, and images. So the number one question, I think, is are you human or are you machine? And you need technologies that are able to make that determination. So liveness is a class of them. Is this a live human being on the other end of an interaction or not? That's going to be where people need to make these investments because deep fakes have fundamentally broken that question have broken trust in big ways, in commerce, in media, even in communication, right? Like we're talking to each other on uh, the StreamYard platform. There are cases like in the uh, case of this Hong Kong wire transfer, where this person got a phishing email, said it was a phishing email. So the, he, he was good as far as business email compromise and said, no, I when I looked at the header, it was not coming from my CFO. And then the CFO said, okay, if you don't believe me, get on a Zoom call. And he got on a Zoom call, had three execs, all deep faked using face swapping technology and said, oh my God, this is my CFO. Oh, he's asking me to do 25 million in wires. Oh, I'm going to do that. He wants me to do it in 16 different wires to 16 different places. Man, it was my CFO on a Zoom call. I'm going to do it. So it's a very different nature. And what it's changed is the fact that you don't know what is human anymore. And also the attackers are using real-time communication a whole lot more effectively. That is, when I get you on a live phone call or on a live Zoom call or a live communication medium, I can apply all kinds of different pressure which I couldn't apply on an asynchronous email. And so I think it's that combination of urgency as well as generative AI that's, you know, that all of all organizations need to create tools to protect against this new class of threats. Well, thank you so much, Vijay, both for, for today, but also I think the contents of this, this report are like urgent reading for people to pay attention to because if you're in a field where this affects you, and it certainly would for almost all businesses and, and does for us as consumers as well, it's important to know what's going on and, and what steps we're able to take currently to defend against. So thank you very much and wishing you and your team all the best in the future. Thank you so much, Karen. I really enjoyed the talk as well. Thanks. Great. Take care. Bye. Okay. 